What's up, everybody? Welcome to Tesla Fix. We heard so many interesting things again. For example, does Tesla have to advertise? How about that? What? Tesla is cutting prices again. What is Elon thinking again? All these topics are so, um, how can I say, mm, irrelevant in my opinion, because there are much, much more interesting things already presented a few months back even. But we don't take attention and we don't pay attention, I mean. So I've invited someone very special today. Scott Walter, the mechanical engineer and aerospace engineer, is joining this episode with me. And I'm pretty excited to talk about the Tesla bot and the real life implications that it has. I don't want to talk about too much about the details. I want to go into the segment. Will this will the Tesla bot will be deployed? How is it going to be? And we're going to watch that. So Please, uh, everybody, welcome Scott Walter after the intro. Welcome to Tesla Fix. Make sure to subscribe and like this episode. So, Scott, thanks for being on. I'm pretty excited to talk to you. Maybe you can present yourself to the audience and talk a little bit about what you do. But most of my audience might already know you. But still, for those who don't, please, you can tell them what you're up to. Ja, guten Abend, Jan. Danke für die Einladung. Es ist schön, Sie Problem. kennenzulernen. <lacht> schön, gleichfalls. <lacht> yeah. Ja, Überraschung. Ich kann ein bisschen Deutsch. Ja, uh, yeah, that's awesome. For most of your viewers, um, not so much. So, yeah, uh, yeah that's my true. name is, is Scott Walter, and I've been in the, the field of robotic and factory simulation for almost 40 years now. Um, I did my uh, doctoral thesis in, in Cornell University in 1985. And from that, we, we spun off a company uh, to look at robot simulation and offline programming in 1985. And then that became part of Dassault Systems in 1997. And then with some other colleagues from that previous venture, we formed another company called uh, Visual Components. And we just kind of continue going on with factory simulation, robot simulation. Uh, I also have a background in aerospace engineering. That's one of my degrees. And actually my first internship was working for an aerospace company and working a little bit on rockets. So I have enough background on there to be dangerous um, and have an understanding <laughs> of what's going on. And in the course of, uh, of when I was at Denver Robotics, I spent eight years in Germany. Oh, in that's Darmstadt why. And in and, and Fier in the nearby uh, uh, Dusseldorf. And I'll have ah, to ask okay. you uh, now, so let's see how much you know about your own country. <laughs> um, the, the the city I was at is the third oldest Stadt in Germany. Um, Founded scared. by the Romans. By the Romans, okay. Along the Rhine. Um, okay. Um, Freiburg, maybe? No, no, let's just okay. say... Constance? It's, it's, the, it's, it's it, nope, nope. No, there, okay, because go, I oh, live in Constance. You go, you go, you go further Constance. north. You go, oh, you're in Constance. Oh, down yeah, there. Yeah, okay. Lake of Constance, oh, yeah. Oh, Bodense, yeah, this is there. Bodense, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very beautiful yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, okay, more up. So, um, Karlsruhe, maybe? More, more up. So, you got to think. More, more up, up, even. Okay. Here's what you do. <laughs> it's basically the dividing line between Alt and Kölsch. Ah, uh, okay. So, okay. It's Köln, the only place you can order both. In the same place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's that would, pretty that good. Would um, no, that would be noise. So it's between Dusseldorf and Noise. Yeah. 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 And, and anyone knows if you go into Dusseldorf and order a Kolsch beer, you're out in the street. And the same thing if you go to Köln and you order an Alt beer, you're out in the street. But noise yeah. <laughs> is like right in between. So you can both okay. go in and order your favorite beer and you're fine. <laughs> Talking about beer because that's why I've, 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 uh, was out of the frame so much. Uh, yes. I've wanted to Giga beer. send you some, but uh, I have it right don't, here. Don't worry, I, I get that taken care of. My name is She actually has two orders okay. sitting there. We just have to come and pick it up. Perfect. <laughs> so yeah, worry. it was very expensive. Recovery. And uh, yeah, I, I hope I can somehow get this to the US someday. But uh, it's pretty difficult. I've just recently it's, became it's, a father. So, yeah. so hard to travel right now. For me so i w wish i could bring it uh, and then we could have enjoyed it but okay uh let's jump into the episode again uh i just wanted to flex for the audience i have giga beer because i live in germany <laughs> yeah, so yeah. but the whiskey is also very cool so sadly yeah. that's not 
so much available. Yeah. But okay, let's get get into the nitty gritty stuff because I think, um, yeah, the Tesla bot is such an exciting um, field, and I I mean the news cycles are so mm -hmm. fast. We all know that, and um, but I think it's always good to take a look again, uh, especially when you see the stock price jumping around and stuff. I don't really care about that. I'm very long term in that regard, and. Um, I really love the company and I want to see um, the real life implications of Tesla bot. I mean, it's interesting to have um, the testing phase, the development phase. We've seen a lot of interesting um, prototypes already. And um, what I found very interesting in your interviews also with um, Dr. Know-it-all, so with John, mm -hmm. uh, was that you've talked about um, that there might be uh, already uh, Tesla bots uh, producing cars uh, already uh, in the test phase at least. So there were already cars um, went um, from the production line made by or one working step or certain It's steps were probably made by steps somewhere in there. And, and, and I have to yeah. try to find where, uh, where we have like an, an image of that. Um, and that when it was AI day two, when they, they first revealed what the Tesla bot mm -hmm. was doing, And there was an image of the Tesla bot picking up some parts and moving yep. it over somewhere else. And there was also some other pictures of it working in more of a, a structured laboratory environment. But it was pretty clear to me looking at that picture. It's like, that's not in a laboratory environment. That's actually in the production hall. You can see it's in the production hall. Yes. It's absolutely mm -hmm. clear. And those were just, I mean, they were actually parts. And I believe Dan Corral, he kind of identified them. He thinks that they might be bus bars that they might have actually been maybe for the semi or something like that. But, you know, there's some, mm -hmm. we, we're not sure. Is it for something for the semi? Is it something for yeah. an XRS or something like that? Um, but it it was touching a production part and it was removing it from one machine over yeah. to another place. And so it's yeah. like, you can say, ah, it actually added a little bit of content to that mm -hmm. by doing that particular step. So, It was more of an aha, and that's not the only time that we're pretty sure they've been doing that because if you go and listen to the, not Elon, but to the actual engineers the team, and yeah. what they have been saying and what they said even in, uh, you know, in AI Day 2 in the most recent investor days is that they are clearly putting it out on the floor and testing it on operations on the floor. That's the whole point. So they've gone beyond yeah. watering plants. They're doing something else and they're trying to find <laughs> You know, what What are the capabilities and the inabilities of this and what do we have to improve? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about them is that this doesn't have to be a product they sell. They, you know, in order for them to actually make, a, you know, so utilize it on yeah. this, they don't have to sell it because they are their own customer. And if they yeah. could reduce the cost of their other products, you know, right there, they make it. And the expression that I've used many times, which I'm sure it, it's also in German, but, you know, it's an old English expression, you know, penny saved is a penny earned. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the same thing. So if they can cut costs using this, then they're saving money. The, and that's the difference between them and a lot of the other robot companies out there, those that are trying to make the humanoid type of robots, is that they are not their own internal user. They have to find an external customer. So mm -hmm. they, they have a very different cash position in being able to keep themselves funded. So they're going to have to rely on VC for a long time or get customers very quickly. And sometimes when you do that, you get it out to the customers way before it's ready. And then you can start running into issues there. And Tesla will be as patient as Tesla needs to be in order to do it. Mm -hmm. So if it's falling down every day, everyone's like, well, that's what we expect. You know, we just keep on working on it until we can get it to work. And what I found very interesting, maybe we can uh, talk about this, the use cases of the Tesla bot in mm -hmm. real life, in a real life environment. Because, yes. of course, the technical details are very interesting. And I also recommend you, and I'm going to link it uh, on top of here somewhere, um, yeah. uh, the video where you talk really about the um, even the uh, small parts, like the fingers, how they move and, and how they engineered that and um, how they are saving costs. So if you want to have a, a, a like a deep dive into engineering stuff, I'm going to link it down below or uh, on top of and, the yeah, right and corner. It, it, get, it gets a bit nerdy and a bit in the weeds in some mm -hmm. places, but uh, yeah, but, but and, yeah. And, and, yeah. So 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 I I want to focus on the like the overall topic like like really where where can it be deployed where where can we use it where where can will we see it uh, in the near term and I thought you had very interesting um, stuff shown also at the interview with um, 
with Herbert Ong, you uh, went on his channel and I yes. really uh, was excited to see that. And I wanted to uh, make an overview here um, to really see, okay, we have this, this and that and how are we going to uh, do that? Because there are some tasks in the factory. Maybe you can talk about that. Right, right. So yeah. the, you know, the, the, the first thing when everyone was visualizing, oh, we're, we're going to have a humanoid robot. What's it good for? And so a lot of people are, are, are <laughs> yes, yeah, a lot of people are, are, are focusing on, you know, what are the, you know, because we've seen that Boston Dynamics, a lot of those were really developed to go into emergency kind of situations, you know, fire or earthquake, you know, so, some sort of rescue. And so they were very challenging missions that DARPA was putting them through. And so everyone's assuming if your robot can't do that, what's the point? And, you know, the others are looking at, well, can we build it mechanically? Can we build a robot that can walk? Uh, do we have the right software suites? All those other things. And for me, it was like, forget about that. Let's actually look at the application. I mean, is there a practical application we can start to use it today, not worrying about the one that's able to do absolutely everything? And usually the standard I have is like, if it can fold your laundry, then that's a pretty good robot. We're not talking about a robot that can fold your laundry, but what can it do? And it's what I've referred to as the low hanging fruit. So it's a very common expression. And it's to the point that I, I, I've said, let's stop thinking about the low hanging fruit because it, it sounds like it's still hanging on the trees. I'm talking about the fruit that's actually on the ground and rotting. Just or if you just want to call already them rotting. the, the, the yeah. Erd Baron, you know, the, the strawberries yeah. that are there, they're so low, they're actually on the ground and very easy to pick. Yeah. And looking yeah. around that, and so I immediately knew but even before AI Day 2, you know, after, after they were doing it, it's like, I know what those applications are. And so um, this, I'm just going to share for a second uh, mm -hmm. this screen right here which was a tweet that I put out a little bit after mm -hmm. AI Day. And this is something that back in August of last year, I had shown a layout of Optimus doing a simulation. Now, this is just an image from it. It's not the actual video. We're going to jump into that video in a second. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to point out is that this is a quote, direct quote from Elon from AI Day 2, where he says, mm -hmm. you know, start Optimus with very simple tasks in the factory loading a part into one of our more conventional robot cells that welds the body together. And it's like, I, I know exactly what he was talking about because mm -hmm. I already saw that um, um, a few months before. And so I just went into one of our simulations. And again, I'm going to have fun here with our screen sharing and popping everything mm -hmm. on up. Let me see, is that I think I have this one right here. I think we can still see that, can we? Or can we? Oh, no, let me go no, ahead and, and pop that back on. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> hit no the right problem. button here. Yeah. And then we go ahead and I um, will share one mm -hmm. of our simulations that I had that was always out there. And that is this particular window right here that we're going to look at. Uh, and so there we go. So this is this is a typical mm -hmm. manufacturing cell that we put together in a simulation with the KUKA robots, which you're probably very familiar with coming from Germany. Yeah, uh, yeah of course. And used a lot in, um, in, in the Tesla factories. And uh, also full disclosure is KUKA is the parent company of visual components. Okay. So we put simulations like this together all the time because when people are studying factory floor simulations, they, they have to take into account all the resources and those resources can also be human operators. So they want to see, you mm -hmm. know, what exactly is a human operator going to do? And it's very common for human operators to load light parts or small parts into a cell and you've got to have all the safety mm -hmm. equipment to make sure it can go in and that you're not interacting with the robots. And this is something I, I called feeding the kookas at the robot zoo, because it's yeah. very much like feeding the lions, right? You, you got to make sure that when you, a piece of meat goes in there, it doesn't bite your hand off or anything like that. So it's the same idea is that you need to have all these protections and everything else. And usually the parts that are coming over here will be in some sort of dunnage. So they may be arranged well or not arranged well. So if they're not structured yeah. well, it's very hard for a robot to figure out where to pick them. So humans are very good at being able to pick up things that are unstructured. So you're mm -hmm. moving around and that's basically the material flow that's going in the factory is you have a humanoid form that has to pick this up and move it around. And I said, yeah. you know, all I have to do is swap the geometry of this operator out for Optimus and voila, I mean, basically mm -hmm. we're showing exactly what, this, what it is. And that's the whole idea of Optimus. It's not to yeah. redesign the cell around Optimus, it's to take an existing cell and just do a one-to-one -one swap out of yeah. Optimus with a human operator and vice versa, because, you know, if you're having a little problem with Optimus in that day, you can swap the human back in. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah and also, 
Um, I found it very interesting that um, in the if you see some recordings of the factories, for example, in Shanghai or also in, in uh, mm -hmm. Giga Texas, but more in Shanghai, I think they had more uh, footage of the of also from the um, factory floor. And it's interesting to see that there, for people who are not in the engineering space, me too, but uh, I mm -hmm. uh, accidentally know this, that they have um, they have cranes, for example, for heavy lifting, for example, or uh, lifting aids. And yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, e exactly. And I think what I can do is, uh, let me go ahead and share uh, this screen. Can you see the screen again? I need to make sure whether I've got it up uh, sharing or not. Whoop. I had it for a second right here and get back to sharing that screen once more. So you, I think you're talking about something like this where, where you have a lift assist. So a, a lot of times when parts are too heavy, the humans are using a lift assist to allow them to bring around. So it's an example of another type of welding cell where again, you just swap out Optimus. So Optimus does not have to be super strong because the humans aren't super strong either. Whenever there is something very heavy, then you have a lift assist that comes around and does the work for you. Yeah, um, I didn't catch it. Um, the, the connection was uh, shortly uh, um, um, stopped. Maybe you can re repeat the first sentence you said. Um, okay. Yeah, the lift assist, yeah, the lift assist. So the, the, yeah, the, the lift assist is there because we always have parts that are way beyond what a human is sort of allowed to do repetitively. And so they're designed to be able to very easily go over, clip onto something, lift it up and bring it on over. So it gives you superhuman strength, which means if it can give a human superhuman strength, it can also give an Optimus robot the superhuman strength needed to be able to move these things around and be able to drop everything in. The other thing to point out is the precision that's sort of needed to put these parts into place is not that high. It's not extremely high. So that means Optimus can be a little bit sloppy, bring it over, and when it drops down, it'll just kind of slide into the right place. And then when the fixtures and clamps close, then that makes sure everything is there. So you just need to be kind of in the ballpark and you'll be all right. So high precision is not a demand on Optimus. Just being able to do these simple kind of tasks repetitively and you know within the correct cycle time is really all you need yeah that's pretty interesting to see because many people think um or or people who are not really in the space they see this um da these dancing um boston dynamics robots and think all oh, right um the, wow look how far we are but still i mean it's yeah. it's more or less motion capture data more or less uh, they they prepare everything they program the paths they try and try, the, the robot always falls over, they have to pick it up again and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And then they edit a beautiful um, showcase of what the capabilities uh, are. And I don't want to discredit, um, I mean, they oh, did no, a actually, great actually, job and everything, great. that's I, awesome. Yeah, I'm glad they had that full disclosure of really showing what went yeah. into making that because we were able to learn a lot about the process and everything else happening. So it's an impressive machine. The applications are very different. So you really yeah. should not be saying that, oh, one is better than the other. It's like different application exactly, yeah. spaces that we're looking at. Uh, you know, my kind of snarky remark on it when everyone was talking about you know, that Optimus can do parkour is I was just you know, asking, it's like, when's the last time that you applied for a job where doing backflips was part of the job requirement? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, not even a gymnastics coach has to do backflips, you know, it's just the yeah. students. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so the requirements are are definitely very different. Now, clearly, if if you're going to have a humanoid robot that's going to be act, acting as a firefighter and coming in and rescuing you from a burning building, I wanted to be the Boston Dynamics robot, okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> if it yeah. has to do a backflip to get me out of the burning building, yes. Yeah. But, you know, for working in a factory situation, it's going to be something else. So we always have to remember what is the application in realizing that it's really good to have these different teams that are just exploring these different spaces. And what's a different way to be able to do this and slightly different kinematic design. Let's see how that works out because that's a whole idea of evolutionary pressure and everything else is to find mm -hmm. what is the best design for that application. So let's make sure we're doing the same thing in the engineering world and we don't have this group think that like, this is the only way. And I think an example of that, if you look at agility robotics, uh, they've come up with a very good, and they, they won't call it a humanoid robot, but I think it's a humanoid robot. It's able to walk. It's a robot that's able to work in the human space. And its legs look a little bit funny, 
because they were not trying to make it identical to a human, but just be able to operate in the humanoid kind of environment. And they took another look at what's the best way to come up with a walking robot. And the legs look a little bit funny, but boy, it works really well. And, you know, John and I were hoping to have an interview with them in the next week or two to find out a little bit oh, more be because awesome. that is a really good kind of design. And, and again, shows that you've got more than one team out there that's really thinking about it which mm -hmm. makes me more bullish and optimist for that reason. So it's not like Elon's mm -hmm. got some scatterbrained idea. I was like, oh, like sending rockets to Mars. Mm -hmm. Like no one really thinks, it's like, why would you want to do that? So, you know, he's now coming up with this scatterbrained idea of wanting to have a humanoid robot. Oh, he's crazy. No, he's not. A lot of people have been working in that space as we see for a long time. We've seen there's lots of challenges. We know one of the big challenges is trying to get it to walk. Mm -hmm. A lot harder than you think. And once you get it walking, you say, ah, problem solved. And then someone yeah, points no, out, like, yeah. uh, Getting it to Lifting, walk with a payload yeah. is different yeah. because suddenly your center of gravity and everything is thrown off almost instantaneously yeah, of when you pick that up. And we could see Boston Dynamics is having a hard time with that too. You know, it seems like it's going on pretty yeah. well and suddenly it's like, oh, it's tipping and it, it can't correct that. Whereas, yeah. you know, the human kind of knows and that's going to come with experience. They're going to figure it out. And that's where the AI and the software is going to solve a lot of the problems. Yeah, that's, that's, I also see it that way. And yeah, what I found so interesting is that, um, the the uh, it's about the scale it's about the production how how they're going to produce the optimus uh, bot you've talked about that also in this episode i've referred in the beginning and that's something i really um find very interesting because it's true you i mean this robot can cost over a million dollars for one robot but um if you the the whole concept of the robot will change if you um consider mass production yeah. And yes. they consider that right away. And that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's always been kind of the Tesla ethos is like, just mm -hmm. deliver really what's needed and not more. And yeah. sometimes that minimalist approach, some people may not like it. Others will really like it because they realize, you know, I'm just getting exactly what I need and not a whole lot more that actually makes my life a lot easier. You know, that's what mm -hmm. I've noticed by, you know, having a Model Y It's the easiest car in the world to clean the interior in. I mean, everyone says, oh, there's nothing in there. You know, where's all the buttons and dials? And, and like, exactly. Where's all the buttons and dials? Exactly. And the so I don't have to worry about that. I'm just going, and I'm done. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of things that's very nice for those of us who don't want to have to go through with Q-tips and going in there to try to get the dust out of all these little cracks and crevices everywhere. And so when you start to take that approach of what's the minimum, and I really like the idea is like you pull out as many parts and processes until you realize you pulled out too many parts and processes and you're going to start putting some more in. So that's um, so they really have stripped it down. And, and part of it is to make sure if you reduce it and simplify it, it's going to be easier to manufacture and produce. And then the more of them mm -hmm. you get out there, you just start driving the cost curve down and everything else. And yeah. so I ask you, Jan, how much would you pay to, to have an optimist that was able to do something useful around the house? And of course, we don't know what useful is yet, but let's say it was able to do something that you felt was useful. How much would you pay? I would say like in entry like like tesla would offer their car maybe twenty five thousand or something like that um wow, you'd be a lot. Okay. It, no but uh, yeah. i don't know i mean i'm a i'm a like early adopter or something yeah and, but okay. twenty five thousand okay. will be very expensive but yeah still uh, that would be fun but but i assume like like ten thousand could be a great yeah, price range or, or seems, around that corner no seems seem to be what a lot of people think you know i, I agree that there's going to be some like you that will be tempted if it's 25 some even even 50 um just because you know being the early adopter and you want to experiment yeah. with it everything else and see how it goes but i think you're kind of right that for you know the general purpose ten thousand dollars if it's able to be something useful a lot of people do it because there's way more things in your life that cost you know close to that you know obviously your car is way more than that but if you look yeah. like things around your house like if you have to put a deck in for your house well boom suddenly that's like fifteen twenty thousand dollars right there or you know a new roof on the house or you got to change mm -hmm. the the heating system it's several thousand dollars so there are a lot of big ticket items within your house that you're not aware of that also add up pretty quickly and then you begin to realize that hmm, okay you know around ten thousand dollars that might be something especially if it gets you a lot of time and utility back you begin to realize that oh wow it's uh you know that's worth that kind of savings so if it can cut the grass for you rather than you doing it or you having to pay someone else you might be able to say well you know 
return of investment on that is you know only going to be a couple of years. Now I have it doing something else over here. Okay, return on investment of that also you know, and then you start looking at it and compounding it all together, and you begin to realize, wow, after a year, it's kind of paid for itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I th I think um this is a very critical point to to get of course the cost down, and um I find the interesting part. If you um, develop a robot in the scenario of real life production right away, and um, I think the whole um, like the whole uh, sheet of use cases really changes mm -hmm. very much because then in a in a like in a um, unnatural environment where you maybe don't use or in a in a, a laboratory environment where you just think about this kind you you try to make adjustments and then okay yeah maybe we shift our process a little bit around the robot because the robot has these mm -hmm. kinds of <laughs> capabilities so now we just yeah. call it different and <laughs> try to be successful with your robot i don't know um, but maybe you, you can you, talk yeah. more about so you, you, yeah. You, yeah you 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 don't want to do that um that's mm. that's a mistake we already made with the, the the current robots is that at first it was like oh the robots can do this stuff and the reason we knew, we know it can do this stuff is because they're doing it in japan so suddenly the americans in, in the early 80s mm -hmm. when they realized there was a problem with quality and cost and everything started importing robots and then they realized that oh the robots don't don't program themselves they don't have the correct <laughs> building so they're literally were sitting in the parking lots waiting to come into the factories when they tried to figure out what it was and then yeah. a lot of the end of arm tooling that you needed they could not just take the, the end of our, or the tools that the humans were using, they had to redesign them to go on the end of the robot arm. And once you did that, suddenly you had tooling that only the robot could use and the human couldn't. And so something happened, then you'd have to come in with something, you know, a, a, another piece of mm -hmm. equipment or there's no way to do it. So it really was like, you were fully committed to getting these automation cells to work. And they learned a lot yeah. of other things that the, the robots are actually so repetitive on, on what they do that if your incoming parts are a little bit out of spec, they will fail mm. and not work. And a lot of times they thought, oh, the problem with the robots. And the, and the thing is, the problem was actually the humans were, would compensate for that. If it was a little bit out, they would go ahead and do it, not realizing they were actually kind of adding to the quality problem because they were compensating for something that was misaligned. The robot will suddenly will have some sort of error. So that almost became your instantaneous feedback if you've got a quality problem. Mm. So they had to go upstream and start making everything better. Your stampings had to be better. Your tooling had to be better. You had suffering. <laughs> so all these things had. So that was like a good thing, you know, whether it was being done robotically or mm -hmm. not, is that you improved all those things. But the problem is you once you were in with the robots, you could not swap them out. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to make that mistake with Optimus. You don't want to say we're going to now start yeah. redesigning the cell around it. Now, they may be a little bit because they are they're mm -hmm. talking about what's going to happen down in Giga Mexico. And, and you remember what uh, Tom Zhu said, you know, I, I don't think he mm -hmm. slipped it out. Yeah. I think he you know, like almost meant it. It's like, oh, you know, how, what do you need to build a gigafactory? When you talked about, oh, you need like, you know, 10,000 workers, you know, may, maybe 5,000 humans and, and 5,000 Optimi. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> okay. So they're thinking about that and the unboxing process and everything to make it easier. So it's, it's almost like it will always be a task a human can do if Optimus can do it. It may not be the other way around. There may still be some tasks that Optimus can't do that we know the humans can do. But we're not going to make the mistake that, you know, if Optimus can do it, the human will never be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's definitely going to be there. The end of arm tooling is definitely going to be, well, they're going to use standard tooling. It's it's, yeah. it's like I say, you're yeah, going to take your normal Hilti or Black & Decker, you know? <laughs> and, mm -hmm. yeah. and it just If it fits in the human hand, you can do that. And then Optimus can go ahead and pick it up and you just do that swap out. You don't have one specifically for it. Now, people are going to be thinking, it's like, oh, but are we going to have like a Bluetooth connected Hilti of some sort that, you know, Optimus just thinks about it and it goes on and it turns off. And it's like, well, we can't quite do that. So, no, it's going to still have a trigger. Yeah, I, I, I really, that's a really interesting point you've touched on because um, that's about um, um, changing the environment that the robots can um, walk around and um, figure everything out. Or the other approach is really integrating the robot in the human space where you say, no, you use our tools that we use. You, yes. you are specced for our, you, you want to replace some some uh, worker there, here and there, but not everybody, of course, because some tasks are too complex still. But that's interesting because uh, German legacy auto companies have a similar approach, especially Mercedes, where... Uh, the whole um, self-driving car 
was um, from the development perspective was like, oh, we're gonna have smart grids. We are gonna have a smart, a smart uh, uh, um, um, traffic light. We have a smart stoplight. We have a smart uh, uh, tunnel system and and proximity sensors and everything. So the car communicates with the world and but but that's the same thing now we have to fit like the so, so the disadvantages or or the um how would how would you say it uh, the the um the problems in programming the making a fundamentally strong programmed uh, robot on wheels uh, versus uh, trying to change the world that this uh, feature exactly. could happen and um Till this day, the this um, development scenario, this um, engineering scenario, they've put themselves into a still prevalent till this day. It's still seen as oh, um, for example, Mercedes had had their drive pilot now, and it's the first level three autonomy uh, system, and you really can read the newspaper, and uh, Mercedes is liable when when something happens and stuff. But it works almost in no case actually, and uh, it it's j just can drive as fast as the person before you, but not until it's uh, right. higher than thirty five miles per hour, <laughs> and stuff like that. So it's it, kind of ridiculous. But I know they 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 could do more, but but still, I think. In comparison to full self driving of of um, Tesla that we've already seen, like huge, uh, uh, like people driving four hours nearly to their destination or even more, making huge road trips with FSD on, with zero uh, in, uh, interactions with the we uh, or interventions, um, yeah, takeover yep. interventions, takeovers, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, this is pretty impressive and a whole different approach because Tesla just said, okay, the car has to see everything and the the our whole traffic system is is for our eyes. So it makes totally sense and it's interesting that Mercedes goes this route of putting enormous amounts of sensors inside of that and this is a like an update nightmare for an uh, software engineer because Every simple part has to be updated. Every simple, oh, which version of the radar did we put in that car? And I mean, maintain the stuff that's, I mean, with all those thousands of sensors, crazy. I mean, the number of SKU numbers you have to have uh, to, to constantly maintain. And then, of course, legacy, the fact that you, ha you have to keep them around. <laughs> and, you know, there's been this debate about, you know, the humanoid robot. It's like, does it really have to have legs? Can't we just put them on wheels? And you'll see there are some examples of, those approaches that have been taken of just going ahead and putting them on a, a small little skateboard, or if you want to call it a Segway or almost a Roomba moving around. Mm -hmm. And my, I, my counter to that is very simple is, is, do you know what was invented after we invented the wheel? You're going to tell us <laughs> roads. Okay. <laughs> so the next invention after the invention of the wheel was like, now we have to start to have the roads. So these things could us. Interesting. They're yeah. not designed to really interact with the world the way the world is. And, true. you know, it's like, yeah. everyone says, Oh, the wheels are the best way to get around. I say, mm, Actually not. talk to a mountain goat, you know, <laughs> it's like, they go anywhere. <laughs> so, so having the idea of, of a, something that's legged, You know, you don't have to worry about going up steps or anything like that. You can get access to anywhere in the factory is that wheels just have to have nice flat surfaces and everything has to be prepared. So the idea is we don't want to now have to reinvent the factory a little bit to be able to handle these things. And we've we've sort of done a turnabout on that because back in the 80s, we already had what looked like mobile robots out there. They were called AGVs, autonomous guided vehicles that walked around, that went around the factory automatically. You know, they, they were wheeled vehicles. It looks like, wow, they're driving themselves. It's like, no, they're not. There's actually like a strip of wire that you'd put down on the floor and it was, it was following that. So they actually had a pathway they went, which meant you had to go in and add something to your environment. It didn't was not, mm -hmm. so you had to prep the environment. Now with mobile robots, they've turned that around. They're using LiDAR for it, of course, and SLAM and everything else to be able to map the environment, mm -hmm. but they are able to successfully do it. And I think It probably didn't even start in the uh, in the factories. A lot of these mobile robots. I think it almost started like in hospitals because they had to go down hallways and they were just doing a very simple tasks of delivering meals okay. or uh, taking some lab samples from here to there. Yeah. And they had to like figure out how to get into an elevator and go up. And but they mm -hmm. were able to take what was like a dynamic environment and do it without hurting anyone because in a hospital you've got more than enough patients. You don't need to create any new ones. So you mm -hmm. they had to make sure all the safety features were there. 
So we sort of learned, let's go ahead and adapt it that way and make sure it works. But I'll, I'll let you come up with a point because then I've got a little bit of a follow up on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. oh no! Yeah, okay. Yeah. No, no, you can. Yeah. It, no, uh, the the point being uh, of everything you've said. Um, sorry, I was uh, zoning out a little bit because I th thought of your points. Um, is that we we uh, uh, altering the environment versus the robot uh, being capable of doing it on its own or or um in going into our environment. Um, and, and the point you you said with the roads is pretty interesting because that's. Pretty much the the yeah. like like the same same thing with the with the lab environment or the environment which the robots are altered for use of a robot. Yeah, pretty yeah, interesting. Yeah. Now it doesn't mean the environment that we won't. Oh, let's say not so much the environment. Let's say it doesn't mean we won't change things a little bit in the factory landscape mm -hmm. to take advantage of optimism. Of course, it's probably the best tweet I ever had. Is I, I put something out there just talking about how it was going to uh, modify that. And it just blew up. Everyone was like, wow, this is like a very interesting idea. So right now, um, if you look like at, the, at the simulation I had, there's the safeguards between the humans and the robots. Yeah. And if we look at the, the Shanghai video, we will see mm -hmm. it gets even sillier that there's like the uh, human operator feet. And I actually have it right here. Let, let me bring it up and, and we can look yeah, at Yeah, maybe that. you can show us. see a little bit. Um, so um, if I go ahead and present again, and we go ahead and share. It's like, uh, and then this window right there, and I think it is this one right here. Okay, so you should be able to see this. So this is uh, what I grabbed from um, from the video, and mm -hmm. we're going to see how the the robot is. Oops! And then I uh, let me go back up one. There we go. That this is a mistake I always make with hitting these things. And just I just need to let that let it run. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's going along here, and we're going to see how mm -hmm. the the robot is picking up parts from here to feed the robots over there. So it's a yeah. robot feeding the other robots. And now you're yeah. going to see the operator is going to come in and now feed the parts yeah. that go into the operator. Now you can see how easy it is. He just picks up two small parts, yeah. just kind of drops them in there because they fit in very easily. That doesn't have to be very precise. And he goes and he does another operation over here. So he's responsible for two sets. The mistake is, oops, he walked in too quickly. Yeah. He broke the yeah. light curtain yeah. while yeah. the robot yeah. was there. He has to do a reset. So Optimus won't do that, takes the part out, and now he goes ahead and feeds it. Now these parts yeah. are a little bit bigger, so he has to. He can't bring in two at a time. He's bringing in one at a time, but still, he's able mm -hmm. to make the cycle time, and we can see what's going on there. So again, you can see right away. It's like, oh, that is optimal for Optimus. That looks really yeah. easy. And you just mm -hmm. go on down there, and you'll see lots and lots of more stages like this. What I'm yeah. saying is a bit ridiculous, and I'm not sure if we're hearing the sound from that because I certainly am. <laughs> is, no, is I'm, I'm not. That, I'm not hearing the sound. Okay. Okay. So. Um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and stop the screen share, I guess. So mm -hmm. what's, what this means is that you, you have that intermediate robot and you get the floor space and everything else instead of like these extra tasks. And one robot came in there, the, the second robot, and it had a gripper on the end of it to be able to pick up those two parts. But also sticking off of it was a weld gun. So it went, would go over, it would drop it into fixtures, and then it would have to flip around and then use its weld gun to do it. So it's a dual purpose mm -hmm. gun. A lot of engineering, a lot of other things that are kind of going on there to be able to get that because you, yeah. you didn't want to have two robots to have to do that. You're trying to get it down to yeah, one. Of course. <laughs> but you're taking up that floor space. So you, you sort of ask yourself, well, you know, why are we doing this? Because at some point you've got that, that uh, grenza or that barrier between mm -hmm. the robots and the human beings and that interface you constantly got to deal with. And what you would like to do is maybe compress that a little bit. So imagine if the humanoid form can actually go into there and do that loading instead of. So suddenly you get rid of that other robot and maybe mm -hmm. you can more direct load the parts with a human. Now, why yeah. don't we do that? You know, a human could mm -hmm. probably, you know, get in and dance around and know how to get that part in there and get out. And he would learn the steps and the choreography and he would get it right for four, five hours mm -hmm. out of the day, but it's an eight hour day and all it has Just, to be yeah, one time, one mistake. So you, you, the whole idea is you have to really keep them separated. But now Optimus will be flawless. And if, if, and if Optimus has a problem, it'll be able to signal mm -hmm. to the cell just through, you know, it's like, oop, yeah. like it, and it will automatically stop. So that means mm -hmm. the landscape, the factory for a landscape is going to change a little bit with the Optimus. So it's almost like going against the earlier ar argument that had said, well, you know, we yeah. want to make sure, you know, it's working in the human world. And now we're asking it yeah. that it's like potentially it could do a little bit more. 
But that's of course, be it, phase because two. we that's, have to secure. Yes. Yeah, we have because we have to secure the human, of course, and this doesn't really apply for the robot. Of course, we don't right. want to like a, a kill a bunch of robots, like ten thousand yes. dollar robots. And, and then, then hopefully that's, we won't because. Uh, Yeah. The, the robot is flawless in its repetition of what it's supposed to do. So we know and the robot, yeah, without right. even seeing, it's going to know right now, duck my head, the other yeah. arm will come yeah. over. I'll go ahead and put it in here and duck my yeah. head again. It just knows yeah. how to do that. And, you know, we yeah. go to Broadway shows all the time and you see stuff like that. You can see the actors know exactly what to do because the choreographer's down there and it's all very humorous. All you have to do is have an optimist remember the steps. But boy, it's really hard to pull someone off the street and teach yeah. them to do that and say, you got to do that for eight That's hours true. a day. No, they're going to make mistakes. So you you have to have that big separation line between them. And that's a mm -hmm. lot of floor space. <laughs> and it's also potentially lost time. So the, the yeah. other things that we, we know is going to change in the unboxing process, which I'm not sure how much Optimus is like part of the unboxing process or is just going to be in there. Mm -hmm. Cycle times are going to show it here. Right, yeah. right. So one of the things right now, the problem with the assembly line is that you have this tack time that was established, I think, almost by Henry Ford. It's in the order of, of like 49, 50 seconds. So mm -hmm. you've got 49 to 50 seconds to complete your task, and then the line moves ahead, and then you got to do the next yeah. one, the next one, the next one. That means you have to make sure that any task that you have cannot take longer than 50 seconds. Actually, it has to be a little bit less because... There's setup and everything else in it. So the actual time of value add might be more like 35 seconds or something like that with the, the time waiting for it to come in, waiting to go out for everyone to, to hit the, their safeties to say, yes, I've actually completed the task. So, yeah, yeah. and anyone can stop the line at any point because they're having a problem. So sometimes they have to design buffers, especially in other kinds of assembly lines that it's possible that if a person goes over on one particular task, it can make it up on the next one without actually stopping the line. Mm -hmm. But if it happens two times in a row, it goes. But then that means you've got this buffer in between sometimes, mm -hmm. but not on, on the automotive assembly line. I'm talking about like the sub-assemblies that might be feeding you know, seats or other kinds of sub-assemblies where they're broken up that mm -hmm. way. Every time you add a buffer in there, you're making things a little bit longer. You want to get rid of the buffers. You want to find out what your constraints are. And mm -hmm. that means sometimes you get like this team of guys And gals are just, you know, going in there to get whatever they have to do to, to get the seats in, to, get, to snap in all the fittings, all that. And they got to get in and out in a certain amount of time. Yeah. With the unboxing, yeah. you can start to change that whole thing and, and say, yeah. all right, how much time do I need for this particular process? And let me do it right yeah. there. Because you know it's annoying that if you have a long series of steps of things that you need to do, mm -hmm. and you know it's going to take you five minutes, but every minute through, you have to stop and do something else. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, pick up the phone and talk to someone or something like that, put it back down. Yeah. And now you're like, oh, where was I? You can yeah, just yeah. see, you can compress all that down. And so mm -hmm. the unboxing process will help that. And I'm pretty sure Optimus is going to play a big role in being mm -hmm. able to change that whole dynamic and that whatever, how much of our time that particular step needs is however much time that step gets. Mm -hmm. And you don't yeah. worry about moving on to some other step because you're halfway through and someone else finishes the other half. And that's what's happening in a lot of the spot welding cells you see out there, the robots, is that a robot can only do maybe somewhere between 20 and 30 welds, spot welds, in the mm -hmm. allotted cycle time. You know, it's quite common. It's actually less than 20 because it's got to move around and hit, hit all these things. Yeah. The Now, corners, there's still yeah. a lot more welds that have to be done there. So it hits certain ones you know, that are more, that are structurally important. Mm -hmm. And then it advances to the next station where another robot with almost the identical end of arm tooling goes in and hits the welds it didn't get. And then it oh, may yeah, go to okay. the next one. So you may end up needing to have, you know, 90 or 100 welds in a particular area, but then it ends up happening over three stations. And then, of course, <laughs> you know, you, you, you see those things that you've got this bevy of robots just coming around. Like usually mm -hmm. there's like eight or more all trying to come in and get to those locations because you're trying to get it done in that amount of time. And then up, oh, we have to allocate so many here and it will be like, uh, you know, horse trading a little bit and that you've got the engineers and everyone sitting in a room to sort of figure out where the welds have to go in a particular car body. And mm -hmm. someone saying, well, this, you know, this station, I've got too many. Can someone else take them? And someone else say, Oh, I might be able to hit it or no, I don't. And it's kind of going back and forth 
And so it says, no, 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 you can't take that well. That, that's critical. That's a geo well. That's got to be in yeah. there because if we don't, the whole part, when that fixture opens up, we're going to lose the stability of the vehicle. So let's mm -hmm. go in there and we got to make sure. So these steps here are going to change that dynamic a lot. Mm -hmm. The landscape is yeah. going to change just with unboxing. And then you throw Optimus in there. Yeah. It's going to be a huge change in the cost structure of building these factories and of running mm -hmm. these factories. And of course, the price of the products that are coming out and the build quality, I think will be a lot better as well. Yeah. And what I what fascinates me also um, in that regard is that the software development team is so like capable at Tesla. And I think there are very few companies that have so, so talented engineers besides SpaceX, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, and, and it's interesting to see that with um, Joe Justice al always likes to talk about this stuff as well is the, um, the um, automated management software that they have that removes the manage line manager. That's actually like just a, like a system. Everybody has a phone at Tesla and mm -hmm. preloaded with uh, special apps. And also they have screens everywhere where, Even if in the production, uh, even if in the uh, the uh, order of a part, is, it was something wrong, uh, like something changes and then the part isn't available, then it changes the task you have to do right away. And then, okay, because then you will be out of parts in the next half hour or something. And so it shifts the, the process and stuff like that. And this combined with the bot that can receive this information and uh, live and then react. react live to that even faster than maybe a human. Um, besides, it already works pretty well there because you don't really need a person anymore there. Uh, so they automate the management, which is uh, <laughs> the first thing you could uh, automate, <laughs> actually, and, all and those I managers. Think, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that was, uh, it was a really good choice because they developed their own enterprise software from the ground up for, for everything. Yeah. Whereas a lot of other companies, they're always buying it from someone else. So they don't quite understand what's in there. And they really handcuff their own developers. So in many ways, these other organizations, they probably have some really smart developers. It's just that they can only do so much with the toolbox they've been given course, that yeah. just prevents them from being able to move ahead because <laughs> there's bugs in it. They don't understand it. They're trying to figure it out. There's all this bloatware and everything else. But when you start building it from the ground up, you have such a good you know, overview, uberblick of everything inside mm -hmm. of there to understand, oh, you know what, I can do this, you know? Whereas mm -hmm. with like the other software that someone else is like, mm, I, we're not quite sure we could do that. That's going to be really inefficient. So there is something about having something developed organically and all these people chipping in and putting it on there and allowing it to go out. And as well as I mean, it's lean because the whole idea is that keeping everything lean and the problem with a mm -hmm. lot of software systems today is they are so overly complex that mm -hmm. they just aren't lean, you know? Yeah. When my first company, Deneb, our first application, we could simulate an entire robot cell with lots of different robots out there. We had the inverse kinematics and we had to do our own shading algorithms. We had to do our own menuing system because they didn't exist. So mm -hmm. we had our, 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 you know, so we didn't have like an NVIDIA card or anything like that. We had to figure that out. We had to figure the user's interface out and we had to develop an application. So nowadays it's mm -hmm. easier for everyone because they already have those tools. Yeah. The problem is those tools have so much bloatware that our, our original applications when we shipped it out to customers was four megabytes mm -hmm. four megabytes okay mm -hmm. and we could do 3d yeah. graphics and everything else with, yeah. with pull down menus and pop-ups and everything else mm. nowadays I, i load an app that does absolutely nothing and it's already mm -hmm. like 500 megabytes or something like that <laughs> it's, it's incredible yeah. how much and i'm just like it can't be doing as much of it and it's because you have all this bloatware that's just being folded mm -hmm. in folded in of stuff of tools that they have to bring in that you just get even though you don't need them. And that mm -hmm. results in a lot of inefficiency. So I can see the advantage that Tesla has of saying, yep, oh, we're developing yeah. everything from the ground up. So we our libraries have only what we need to have. What's in the car is only what needs to be there. We can run our over the air updates properly and correctly because yeah. we know exactly what it is. We, it's our standards. Mm -hmm. We're not monkeying around with anyone else's. So mm -hmm. there are advantages to doing that. Yeah, and if you compare it now with like a small segue here um, to VW, um, where you have the situation of um, they've they're just a brand, they're just a car brand, more mm -hmm. and that's it. They they 
outsource nearly everything besides the uh, last uh, manufacturing steps, of course, they bring everything together. So they also like Tesla also has suppliers, but um, it's on a different level because they also have software suppliers. And that's pretty uh, the whole nother story because um, then mm -hmm. they have this Frankenstein of a, of a software in their cars, yeah. uh, which has an arm from, from there and a leg from there. And um, I mean, their navigation system looks like a Garmin from 2008 because it's probably based on a Garmin from it 2008. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and um, stuff like that. So it's, it's so not interconnected and not developed for this use case that it's like, yeah, it, it's they still have problems with their software. Um, cars that yeah. are on the one point dot 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 um, are are not able to update to version two point oh and stuff like that because they're not capable of doing that, and so <laughs> it's horrible. Or or uh, the over the air update isn't functioning properly. People have to go to a dealership to mm -hmm. load up a USB stick into the car to get their software in the in the times of 5G. It's ridiculous. I don't know uh, how how this will prevail, but uh, okay, now they fix some of that stuff. But but this is this shows you um, how important it is to be in house and to have everything like everything important in house. Of course, Tesla doesn't want to have they've said it many times they don't want to make everything but just if something constrains their target goal or their goals they're gonna um try to um vertical integrate if if nobody can make it better but they really want yeah. suppliers but that's such a good approach to to uh, centralize it and also doing the pandemic for example i have to put it um the one advantage also um out there the chip shortage was a prime example because they they could have oh which chips can we get? Ah, those, okay, now we're going to program our software um, to fit to this chip. And everybody else said, oh, okay, we're going to halt production. We don't have chips. And nobody yeah, could yeah. Um, offer cars. And that, it, it, it's yeah, crazy. When, when, you have, when that's your software, you own your destiny. And that's the problem is a lot of the other OEMs, they lost the ownership of their destiny because they farmed way too much out. And it also shows that they don't, really understand what's involved the process of developing software so when they talked about what they're going to do with the carryout division and was it they were going to hire five thousand people or something like that just 10, fell 000, out of my chair it's like ten thousand like whatever thousands doesn't matter i mean that's just the <laughs> five thousand it's, it's an insane number you just don't need that many you know the only analogy I can a think hardcore like, team oh, of gonna, 10 people we're, yeah. gonna, we're gonna build a city and we're gonna like hire all the carpenters <laughs> And just tell them to show up and now build the city. Like, no, you need like architects and planners and stuff like that. And you can do it with a much smaller number. So when people talk about, you know, the competition is coming or are you afraid of, of who's going to knock Tesla off the, the perch? I'm just like, it's not going to be legacy. I'm more afraid of the garage with five guys in it than I am with, you know, the OEM that says, we're hiring 5,000 people. I'm like, sure, where are you going to get them? How are you going to organize them? How are you going to manage them? How are you going to make sure they know mm. what's going on? It, you, they, it, which really surprises me because I've always thought, you know, Germany was a, a country that was really known for being able to organize things very, very well. And I don't know if they were still thinking that where they had these organizational charts. Like, oh, it'll be like this and all come down. We'll just be able to do it. And boom, look at the bottom of the pyramid. 5,000 is what we need. There's, there's something crazy because we know Silicon Valley, every company that's been successful has started out as basically a garage band. Mm hmm yeah, and my opinion, I have a strong thesis on that in the like around 1995 or something, um, Germany started to regulate software development so harshly that um, many of the startups just went to Silicon Valley, actually, because they said, yeah. oh, let's go into the country that doesn't restrict us right away and doesn't try to tax us to the ground before we even developed anything. Uh, so the, the startup mentality in Germany is... Uh, not not there and um, i really see that still we we have a pretty much uh, very old mindset of 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 fact of a factory like like the industrial revolution it's it's still mm -hmm. very old school and I, I know we have improvements and i don't want to discredit the german engineers that that really are are good at what they do and everything but i still feel that um the people who decide the stuff um yeah are a little bit behind it's in that uh, regard and um yeah it's kind of sad actually because germany is known for their uh, great en and, engineers yes can you still hear me yeah. yes yes i can and, and okay, I, okay. I think that there is um 
you know, I had a glimmer of hope uh, about 10 years ago that, that Germany mm -hmm. was going to be on, on the good because they finally kind of got it. And no one quite understood what they're talking about. And that's when they came out with the you know industry 4.0, this whole idea of mm -hmm. industry 4.0. Yeah. They, yeah. they understood it and they had the vision of everything. And it was really hilarious at first because it's the first time Germany understood branding and marketing <laughs> because yeah. everyone thought it was a standard. And they would be coming to these conferences and everyone's just like, well, oh, can you show us the standard? Where's the standard? <laughs> so and they're like, yeah. no, there is no standard. It's a concept. And the thing yeah. about Industry 4.0, it's, it's the fourth industrial revolution. And yeah. we can, his, historians can go back and point to a particular date to say, oh, the, the first industrial revolution started on this day because this is when, when Watt or Newcomb came up with the steam engine. And yeah. then they'll point to another one, another one, another one. But they said, you know, Industry 4.0, we're not sure where that date is. It may have been 2005. Maybe it's, it's, it's going to be 2025 or 2035. But we know there's this transition and we know it's going to involve the Internet of Things and these factories that can reconfigure themselves. And so they had this grand vision and said, but it's not like there's some industry norm because Germany is like always known for the DIN norm. So everyone was expecting that. So where's the DIN for it? It's like, no, it's this concept. Everyone start working on the different pieces. And... Unfortunately, they, they just kind of haven't picked up enough from that, but they had the idea. Yeah. It's like, push ahead, push a little bit forward. And yeah. it was really nice that people were actually using it by the German name in many ways. They were saying Industry 4.0 because it really yeah. came from Germany. And in the US, yeah. they co-opted. It's now, it's, it's, I think it's IIOC or they, they let the National Bureau of Standards and Technologies kind of take that one away from them. So it's, it's got a slightly yeah. different name, but it really started in Germany. They had the idea. Yeah, but but yeah, but but I th really think that um, Germany, with their red tape policy that they um, <laughs> that is fairly prevalent here, um, that's pretty sad. I think there this brain drain that always is happening here, as uh, especially in the software space, people are just like they go to Zurich to Google, for example, or uh, to Google mm -hmm. headquarters. Even in Germany, it doesn't matter, but it's an American company, so the, all the knowledge, all the all the things uh, just f go through the uh, go go to the U.S. over the Atlantic, and um, uh, th that's why um, even politicians like our Chancellor Merkel said in around 2009 that the internet or, or 2010 or even 12, I think, is that the internet is Neuland, which means a new. Uh, Like mm -hmm. a new frontier? Yeah. No, it's frontier. not. Yeah. It's already yeah. here. Hello, yeah. and and so you see that people in the in the who are on the uh, in, in control really don't have the knowledge base of of they don't know what they're talking about, and it's pretty interesting. I mean, we see and also seen that when Mark Zuckerberg was in front of uh, your uh, uh, like uh, how's it called? Um, When he was uh, questioned by the, um, but the, I think it was a Senate, it was a congressional the Senate. Hearing, yeah, was yeah. Okay, you can see that there are also still some some understanding issues oh. with how how everything how, how social media everything. works. Yeah. But mm -hmm. but still, um, I I really think there was a huge brain drain, and this is uh, fe uh, you can feel it t till today. And I think um, Germans always overcomplicate stuff. That's really a thing um, from our culture, which is horrible. They are good in sanitization. They're really good at Uh, at standardizing and being very precise in everything, but they tend to over-engineer. You can see that in the cars where they have hundreds of buttons of use cases that nobody really uses because they are so right. focused on their product instead of the customer. You have to, how is it used? It, Not how, right. where the engineer it, it can, depends, can... It depends on the brand. History. Yeah, yeah, okay, I, yeah I, I can, we, we have that's the same true. problem in the US is that Whenever I would rent a car on a flight or a business trip, something like that, if I got into Ford, I was just completely confused because Ford has definitely way too many buttons. <laughs> yeah, Their okay, cars yeah. are a bit cleaner. Okay. And I think the, you know, the, the German analogy is probably Bay and Bay. There's it sometimes it's like overly complicated. But mm -hmm. when I've been in like in the Mercedes, I, I'm just surprised, like, wow, it's really simple. I mean, they've they've really made sure that you don't get lost in there, that everything you want needs to be there. So I know they can do it. I, I absolutely know what could be done. The one problem that I noticed when I was over in Germany is, is this, the product wasn't ready to be shipped until it was like 120% complete. Yeah. It, it was, it was always like, it has to be absolutely perfect before it goes out and they didn't want anyone to be able to see it. Whereas in the U S you know, we like, like 
when it gets around yeah. 80%, we're putting it, we're putting it out there and we'll we'll deal with the complaints and the feedback and everything else. And it allows us to move ahead. So what ends up happening is that because there's that obsession of such perfection, they get leapfrogged by everyone else. And by the time their product comes out, it's absolutely great, super hardy, but mm, it's like a year or two behind where everyone else is. Yeah, that's pretty that's much true. And we've seen that in the also um we have the digitalization of the of the um of the healthcare um environment. And um yeah, it's it's a project that was announced, I think, 2000 and is still ongoing. So mm -hmm. so 23 years and the whole standards, the whole th like everything, every platform changed and now it's still based on email and stuff like that. It's pretty mm -hmm. horrible. Or Germany tried to fund this project, the email, which was like a <laughs> digital postal thing that you can approve that is uh Uh, and it was, yeah. uh, and it's in use today. Yeah. But but uh, they just spent millions of euros to to that cause and stuff like that. Really shows you that um, yeah, we're not really capable. Or in the 80s, for example, um, Chancellor Kohl uh, did something very horrible because he and his friends at um, I, I don't know, um, it's, it's a huge um, TV mogul um, here. Um, He was in the uh, copper cable industry or TV industry where he mm -hmm. lays those copper mm -hmm. cables. And guess what they did? They said, oh, we're going to not choose um, fiber. We're going to choose copper. Copper. And then they put everything into copper until today. And now see what we see. And uh, South Korea, for example, invested immediately, immediately in fiber optics because it was obvious that this was the technology for the future and they even if it was more expensive and now look at <laughs> south south korea um how how yeah, and, and far they are with their internet and everything with the connection with the uh, and now still in germany we have like the connection holds everywhere just in the big cities we have great uh, network and and um yeah no, nothing is moving here actually and it's now the fiber cables are coming but hey this is going on for so long i, I even Until I was born, I'm I'm 33 and I'm still waiting for like a great yeah. fiber optic line. <laughs> Trust me, But, every summer yeah. when we come over there, it's sort of the, the same thing. It's just like, oh, we got we got to deal with the slow <laughs> speeds over here and everything. It's just yeah, it's it's or, it's a bit. Or the autobahn and 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 now now all, all this all this stuff going on. Sorry that I interrupt. On the autobahn, for example, Mercedes is reliant on the mobile internet uh, mm -hmm. now. And guess where you don't have network at on the autobahn. That's autobahn. the problem. Yeah, yeah interesting. It, and and it, now, it, it, wow, it can't drive itself because it doesn't have connection here. So so now you see the ripple effects of, of decisions that are made and uh, how 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 to stagnate a country that's that's how you do it yeah I, I can't <laughs> see. Are, are you old enough to remember the debacle with i think it was the lkv mount the yeah the, the whole idea that for the you know germany is basically the crossroads of europe and so yeah. all the trucking goes through there at, at some point but it's the only country that doesn't have a vignetta which basically means you, you know you, you don't yeah the autobahns are free but you know as soon as you get into like any other country it's like whoop Suddenly, you've got to buy this little sticker to put on there. You know, Austria is famous for that. Yeah, yeah. Switzerland is famous yeah. for that. And so everyone's saying, yeah, you know, it's like, this is just kind of unfair that everyone's using our Autobahns for free. And what mm -hmm. can we do about it? And But we don't want to impose it on the cars. And should we do it with the trucks? And so they came up with this uber complicated here. Because, I I mean, you have to use the German word to explain it. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Much, this isn't don't do much justice with, like, how... Like this really weird way of being able to track the trucks to try to find out how many kilometers they were driving to fairly do them. And it was billions and billions and billions of euros in this infrastructure they had to build along the Autobahn, which frustrated a lot of people because it created stau here and there while they're doing this. Yeah. And, it was just like, and the thing is, it never worked. And there was cost overruns. And then in the end, it was like, why don't you just like put GPS trackers in the <laughs> trucks and be done with say. it? And that's in the end what, what it is. That's all yeah, it is. That's, it's it's so oh. yeah, it's so crazy. And and uh, like I've I've worked in the software industry here, uh, also in the in the medical yeah. space. That, that what, what I was mentioning there, I was working on this project, and it is overly complicated. It's ridiculous. They've um, I think Germany really tries to um, like put companies into a direction or control the companies by legislation, of course, mm -hmm. but in a way that is so controlling that's almost like a 
crazy ex-girlfriend or something that's stalking you or something. It's really <laughs> crazy. And and that's how they regulate. And they at first they start to regulate. And that's why here it's also very important to be near the the lawmakers so you can really influence the law. And I also think uh, Mercedes, for example, lobbied very well um, in that regard to get their level-free autonomy system here. And um, for me, it could be possible that if they make a law like, oh, you, uh, LiDAR is mandatory now. What happens with FSD? If they decide something like that, it's it's uh, pretty much game over here for FSD. But we will see. I mean, we can't live in the Stone Age uh, too long. <laughs> then what happens is that, okay, so, you know, Mercedes has a German market locked up because they rely on, on, on LiDAR. Great, yeah. But it doesn't work anywhere else or yeah, it's too expensive. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. You know, again, it's the whole idea of, you know, it's like, well, let's, we get the solution for being able to tax trucks. Let's see if we can start selling it to France and everyone else. Is, you know, it's like, no, it's not going to work. No, no, but, so yeah. you, you've got to make sure that you, yeah, you, you have to allow innovation. You do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's interesting. That's why um, I like also to compare and my the, the channels also for like really um, putting a light, shedding a light on this because mm -hmm. many Americans also think, oh, VW, many think oh, VW and Mercedes are real competition coming from here and blah, 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 because we still have those, this, this, there's a like a mystical legend around Germany, like made in Germany and everything. And don't get me wrong, we have great innovations. We have great innovative companies. We have many hidden champions. I won't, won't discredit that. Absolutely. I mean, a Groman automation was bought by Tesla. And guess mm -hmm. what they do? They're going to do the 4680 batteries and they are like, they are having like the small machines for the line for, for producing. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the those machines that that throw around those battery cells uh, th those are from Groman Automation for example and it's pretty interesting um, that yeah Germany has many of those smaller um, hidden champions um, yeah and, that, and that's where Germany is special is is it's really the the mid sized companies it's not the ones mm -hmm. that you've heard of it's a lot of these generational companies that are so, almost in the middle of nowhere but they have incredible expertise. And when it comes like mechanical design, a lot of other things, it's just, it is incredible how good mm -hmm. that is. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes when it comes to the software or some forward thinking, you, you get other people that it just gets top heavy and things fall apart. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it's like, it's a little bit of like, oh, hey, we're, we're venting on Germany. It's like, it's, it does really well. You know, like I said, the parent company I work with, uh, KUKA is a German company and yeah. they build some just amazing equipment. And, you know, they do have an obsession with precision and getting everything. And, you know, a lot of them in there sometimes will complain that you know, we should be getting this out the door because we're just obsessing a little bit too much. But sometimes when it comes mm -hmm. out, they're really good. There's a reason why SpaceX is, you know, using KUKA robots because mm -hmm. they, you know, they are just really, really good. They're mechanically, mm -hmm. they're very good. The precision is very good. You know, you might be able to say, oh, there are a few things you might like a little bit better on, on the control software or something else mm -hmm. that's kind of a bit complicated for maybe the more average user. But, you mm -hmm. know, you're talking about a Tesla engineer or a SpaceX yeah. engineer that's like, that's what we want. This is the, the, yeah. the big yeah. kit that we want to have. So, yeah, the, you you do get yeah. amazing engineering excellence coming out of Germany. I've seen it in the schools. I've seen the way the mm -hmm. um, these internship programs that work that really show people how things work so there's a lot of that yeah. that you know we should be emulated in other places we just kind of wish germany would pick up some of the other and evidently they have mm -hmm. and that is like an educational system you're working on your masters right yeah that's true right i think about 10 years ago that didn't exist right mm -hmm. yeah we have the diploma uh, or um yeah mm -hmm. the magister which is a yep. little bit higher than the master even right. uh, it's a little bit longer and yeah and, and, and they that's, changed that's, it. And that's the, the interesting is, as unfortunately, uh, in Germany, when you went to get what we thought would be like a bachelor's in, in the U.S., it's a much longer drawn out program. So you get a diploma engineer and everyone in America says, oh, you just got like a bachelor of engineering. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> that's no. easily yeah. equivalent to any master's program. But but that's where you yeah. I mean, th that is your first degree in Germany. That's what people don't yeah. realize. And usually most. Germans are like, what, 27 or so by the time they actually mm -hmm. finish that, whereas yeah. the Americans, they're done by age 22. 
So uh-huh. Uh-huh. there's a huge difference that was in there. And they were saying, hmm, this doesn't work. These, these people aren't actually going to be productive members of society until they're almost 30. <laughs> <laughs> we have to change this, this, this yeah. whole thing. So then that's when they started to come up with kind of the American style program. And you've got the, the mm. four year. And I think even your gymnasium used to be 13 years. Mm-hmm. It's now 12. And, now they reduced it to, and then to you have the four year, yeah. I think, bachelor's or you call it baccalaureate or I'm not sure. Nee, bachelor, bachelor. It's yeah, bachelor. bachelor. And then then master's yeah. and you kind of go on yeah. there. Uh, so so it, it's picked up from that, realizing that we had to, they had to update the, mm-hmm. the educational program a little bit. And of course, the other mm-hmm. reason why things get bad is you used to have that one year required Bundeswehr. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you graduated the equivalent of high school when you were 19. You served one year in the mm-hmm. Bundeswehr. So you didn't even get into university until you're age 20. And then it was anywhere from five to seven years to really do it. So it's like, that's (laughs) That's why you're already pretty old. Yeah, 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 that's true. And uh, yeah, but but um, maybe coming back to the whole topic and try to wrap up this uh, episode. (laughs) What's this got to do Um, with optimists? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, but I think it's uh, it's important sometimes to to look also on those contexts because um, people are pretty easy to say, oh, here's the Tesla competition or here's happening that, but people have to realize, okay, this this has to go into your model as well that it on the surface maybe it looks like there is competition or or that Germany really is is. Uh, in that space very strong but if you really compare it not so much and uh, those disadvantages like even if they are small they have a ripple effect on everything and i think they are much slower that many people think because vw just because it's a strong big um international um car manufacturer with around 10 million uh, produced vehicles per year or 8 million now i don't know really um how much the number is now but still um it it yeah, you have to look at this and, and Tesla really, I like to compare it because then you see, okay, Tesla, ah, that's why Tesla is better because if you compare, you can look at Tesla, you can look at the competition and if you really compare it, that's why I, I like Tesla is like a breath of fresh air in the German uh, think, think how, how the Germans are thinking or the German culture. So I really applaud what they are doing. And um, back to Optimus, um, yeah, that this kind of technology wouldn't have happened like this maybe here, especially in the software space. That's that's the big thing, and I think right. also the vision with vision software, the AI developments that are happening. I mean, yeah, they are crazy. Like it's it's really much uh, just mind blowing to what what's happening and, there, and I want and, people and to I'm, notice that. And I certainly hope there is a little bit of a of a shift around there because yeah. the whole mission of Tesla is not to wipe out the competition. Of course, it's, no. to, it's yeah. to accelerate the transition to renewable energy, and that means you know getting all the big players to kind of come around. They're beginning to see it. The question is, they have to figure out what exactly is the plan. How are they going to be able to do it without going bankrupt themselves? So yeah. they're, they're they're going to have to come up with that, and they need to really get kind of serious. And, and there are some companies that are getting serious about it. We certainly thought Volkswagen was getting serious mm-hmm. about it for a while, and and then it was mm-hmm. it seems to be a bumpy road. So I'm not quite so sure. Um, mm-hmm. There's definitely going to be some consolidation. You know, the, the the whole yeah whole landscape is definitely going to shift on what it looks like. You know, the car companies we think we know what I mean. As it is in, the, in Detroit, we're already confused. And what do we call Chrysler these days? Because you know, remember, it used to be Daimler Chrysler. It was it used to be just Chrysler. And there was Daimler <laughs> yeah. Chrysler. There was Fiat Chrysler. And you know, then then they change it to FCA, and now it's it's Delantis, and then you just don't know how many more mergers are going to happen in there, and you know the same thing could happen uh, in Japan as well. Is uh, is I, I wonder how many Japanese automotive companies are going to come out of that because they don't seem to be taking it serious because they don't think it's going to work in Japan, mm-hmm. and that is a big mistake for them is to think mm-hmm. that well we you know, we don't we don't have the electrical production capability in Japan so we have to stick with either fossil fuel or with hydrogen. <laughs> it's like well it's, where does the hydrogen come from? If, yeah, if you need electricity yeah. for that, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very very, very interesting. interesting. Very interesting um, stuff uh, going on. And one last question I had for the Optimus bot was, uh, where do you think the Optimus will be produced? Because um, those there's something that's also pretty interesting. Maybe you have a take, maybe not. But I uh, was no. I wondering. mean, we've we've kind of thought about that, and mm-hmm. the the thing about it is, is it could be produced anywhere. Mm-hmm. 
you don't need a long production line like you have down in Texas. You, you can probably put it wherever you have the space. So we joked about this. You know, uh, John and I were on uh, Randy Kirk's channel. And we were kind of talking about that. Mm -hmm. And it was more or less like, oh, you could just sit it up in an abandoned shopping mall somewhere. I mean, the square <laughs> footage you need for that is, is nothing. You don't need any heavy equipment. You don't need a gigapress. Um, you don't need stamping presses. That's true. You, you don't need anything that would be considered heavy industry. So you could go in an area that's zoned like, you know, light industrial or something like that, because um, there may be some castings, but maybe the castings can be made locally, or you have a supplier that's putting those together and then you could regionally do it. So as far as where are they going to do it? Well, they recently purchased some square footage uh, just outside of the Fremont plant, which everyone is speculating, what is that for? And it's somewhere between the port and Lathrop and Fremont. So it kind of forms a triangle. They're, they're all very close. And, they could be doing it because Fremont is just cramped. There's just no room left there for anything. So yeah. if you're thinking of setting up another pilot line, you might want to try to do it somewhere else. And they leased it as opposed to you know, outright purchasing it. So that's different. But it could also be battery storage for Lathrop because Lathrop is where they're building the, the mega packs. But that parking lot's really small. And you yeah. know you don't have like a pipeline of batteries coming in from, uh, from China. They're coming in in these big container ships and you got to offload those things and put them somewhere mm -hmm. and then maybe bring them up to the factory. And so that's one possibility. Or is that like where they're thinking of assembling these, these optimists? Because one thing we didn't talk about is like, you know, how many are there out there or how many will there be by the end of the year? And there's been this big speculation. Is mm -hmm. there just going to be like a dozen or a couple dozen by the end of the year or more? And I've, I've been on the record thinking that they're going to have at least 500. Randy Kirk thinks there's going to be a thousand or more. So by, by December, we're going to think they would have those many up and running just because you need the training data. You need to go out there and mm -hmm. you need to start doing it. And because they're really easy to build. So yeah. where do they have the square space? Either bought it there. They might have it actually out also in uh, Sparks, Nevada. I think mm -hmm. there's a, enough excess capacity there in Giga Nevada that they could be assembling yeah. it there. And it's a little bit out of sight, so no one really knows, but they have everything that they need to be able to put it together an Optimus there. And certainly they, you know, eventually, depending on if they need to crank out really big numbers, you're going to be seeing it happening in Giga Texas. But right now, I think their hands are full with getting yeah. Cybertruck and everything else up that they're probably not thinking of, like, putting any of that in there. It's going to yeah. be somewhere in California, Nevada right now because it's close to the development team, which is in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. And so they're doing prototyping in Palo Alto, maybe testing it in Fremont and then finding some location to kind of put it yeah. together. So that's my long-winded yeah. answer to a very simple question. <laughs> no, but but that was good. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. I think we need this context to end this because it's always speculation at first and yes. because we don't have any yeah. evidence or, or some some indications maybe, but, but not more. It, the, the park count is very, very small. So, and, yeah. and there's nothing really complicated. So we did a breakdown, uh, again, John, Randy and I looking at that. It's like, how hard is it put together? And, and well, the most complicated part is the board itself. So that's being manufactured somewhere. Yeah. The second most complicated might be the battery pack, but it looks like the battery packs are probably being produced in, in Sparks, Nevada. There's already some indication that the, um, uh, the actual shell that the batteries are going in and the types of batteries are all, all probably coming. So they might be producing that part or say, well, let's just do the rest of it. And then mechanically, everything else is very simple. The joints are all very simple and they just have to figure out how to make those servo drive, but they already know how to do it. Tesla, that's what they do. And they'll yeah. probably simplify that a little bit because at first you're like, wow, it looks like pretty complicated. But then if you look at some of the videos they have, you can see yeah. that, oh, they're putting it together, you know, in the in the lab. They go over to a CNC machine and make a few things. They're able to make their little circuit boards as they need in-house. You know, obviously, it's a little bit painstaking mm -hmm. and, and slow, but they could speed that up. So probably yeah. the limiting factor might be how quickly they can produce the servos. But they have a small part count there. Well, let's say skew count as far as the number of servos, six total. They have yeah. 28 mm -hmm. degrees of freedom, freedom, not including the fingers. So, you yeah. know, just the, 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 the normal body. And you know, rather than having 28 individual servos, they've nailed it down to just having six. Yeah, and then if crazy. you look at it, there's a lot of symmetry. So I'm not convinced there's a left arm and a right arm. I think it's the same arm. There's a left hand and a right hand, but you just kind of pop a different one on there. Mm -hmm. And then almost the same with the legs. So the legs look the same. They might have just like a different foot pad to make it look like a left foot mm -hmm. and a right foot, but everything else is the same. So it's not like 
you have to have two different castings for this and that. We're using everything yeah. the same and reusing motors and everything else. So it's uh, yeah, that makes it more simple also for spare parts and everything. Everything. Oh, yeah, that's, it's, that's just awesome. the part count is so, 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 so small. And then <laughs> the only question is going to be whether they're going to increase the number of joints. And they did an interesting thing on the joints is that first they announced, you know, the total number of joints they were mm -hmm. going to have. And we were spec, you know, looking at where they were, and it looked like they had two in the head. So I was able to, to you know, you're going to have two degrees of freedom here. And I speculated it would really suck at soccer because it didn't have like this one. You know, mm -hmm. that that's the one that you you get the header with, right? Yeah. It wasn't able to do that. It could do that. It's like, ah, oh, it's going to be really bad at that. Um, but the arm only had six degrees of freedom. And the expectation is like, shouldn't it have like a seventh one in there so you can get the wrist around? Because clearly they put three in the shoulder, mm -hmm. which an industrial yeah. arm doesn't have. Industrial arm only has two. So it's like, well, mm -hmm. there's something sus about that. And then when they showed the very first prototype, um, they had a six axis arm for sure. And they took two away from here. So suddenly mm -hmm. the, the because count went down. To to, but yeah. then they realized, oh, we need it here. So they ended up taking yeah. two from the head and then putting them back yeah. down here in, in the wrist because they realized, oh, we need that little bit extra. So again, that's their philosophy of yeah. keep on removing things. And someone probably said, why do we need the head motion? I mean, we have yeah. this huge field of vision. The only reason you move your head is so you can look at something. Yeah. But yeah. if you can look around like that anyways from your cameras, and they have at least four yeah. cameras because we know there's two here mm -hmm. and there's at least two here. Yeah. So they, they have that. So they have more than enough for peripheral vision. Yeah. And if they need to see something over there, they can always do this. You know, <laughs> it's like, it may not be the best and the quickest way, but yeah. if you really need to, and if you've got a wide field of view, then that's more than enough. If I really yeah, have to see that's something true. that's behind me, I'll turn around. I can't even do it with my head anyways. I have to turn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Maybe okay, you can, crazy. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, but but that's pretty interesting. I think um, Optimus will be very revolutionary and um, we don't hear anything about it anymore, more or less. It's Many they're, people they're... are distracted from different news um, right now. That's why I've, I really mm -hmm. wanted to, even if it was kind of late news, like in the news cycle, but still... I think it's, it's out hugely there. important. It's it's yeah. Out, yeah they're doing it right now and and Let's, people yeah we've got Let's forget May sixteenth May sixteenth coming up which is the shareholder meeting yeah don't know if they're gonna say much about it they did it in the in the investor day said just what they wanted to say you know they didn't release any new models and like that they're not going to release the Cybertruck or anything else at the shareholder day but you, we might get an update on Optimus, or there mm -hmm. might be a question or two, yeah. or people milling around might be able to do something. And of course, we're hopeful there's going to be an AI day three, maybe sometime in the fall. And that's probably when they really will announce and show something. But don't be surprised yeah. if they don't show another video, because they keep on putting a video out here and there that's more these these PR kind of videos. Mm -hmm. And the last one was in January on that. So maybe yeah. we see something. But I agree, it's it's been very quiet, yeah. very, very quiet. And uh And it's because, like you say, there's like all these other things that are kind of going on. They're sucking yeah. up the, the oxygen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a discussion point. But I'm trying to keep my eye on it, but I haven't really heard yeah. anything, anything more than that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm glad you're keeping the awareness going. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's uh, hugely important uh, to also look at stuff like that because, uh, like, yeah, Tesla is just like more or less like an ETF of uh, many technology companies in one, I, I would say. And um, yeah, so very exciting times. So um, maybe we wrap up the episode now because I think we touched on many, many points and I think uh, we've spread awareness a little bit. Also, we talked mm -hmm. about the German uh, engineering space, which is also, I think, important to look at because Germany is such an like, innovate or, or was for a long, long time this big behemoth of, of automotive engineering. And now it seems like uh, the facade is crumbling <laughs> right now yeah, but, and but we still know, but, cater to but don't give up on the manufacturing that, yeah you know it may it yeah. may be that you're yeah. losing the shine a little bit on, on the automotive designs but deep underneath it you get this incredible manufacturing yeah, that's base true. that's needed that's to true. design a lot of the components that go in anything one thing that surprised me is if you look at like the apple iphone and it was the breakdown yeah. of the content on when yeah. you know how much goes to each country for yeah. the components in, in the iphone And it's like less than 3% goes to China, even though like the whole thing is like assembled there. And you have some US pads, it's like one of the more dominant com countries in there was Germany. Yeah. Which really surprised yeah, me. It's like, what do they have to do with yeah. the iPhone? Yeah. yeah no, but, but that's, you know, that's, you got to make the thing. 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. I, I mean, uh, on my channel, of course, I'm a little bit, uh, a little bit. I'm very critical on on the, especially the German legacy auto companies, because many people tend to be more or less positive about it, and I say, ah, if you look really close, uh, it doesn't shine as bright as you think. But still, you are right. I have to give them that. For example, like I said before, uh, Groman Automation those companies um like there are mm -hmm. very ma many many niche companies and bosch is a huge company that provides so many parts and siemens also siemens, and right. uh, yeah and and so we have a lot of technology from germany there very specialized uh, equipment very specialized um um stuff supplying other companies like you said the the iphone and, for example and, also and, 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 and you will see uh, that like those the small to medium-sized companies that no one's heard of because they're not on the stock exchange you'll go in germany and they'll they'll be in some niche market and um the number one the, number the, two, the, the number one country, in the world companies yeah. in the whole world are yeah, in germany that's true and then yeah, you that's know, true. three and four you have to go outside and so they're yeah. very competitive and they're in these small villages you don't know about it but just yeah, really yeah, I know. Good. And that is the I secret. I always besides those company. companies. Yeah. Yes, yes, that is the secret to German industry that no one knows about. They keep on thinking, yeah. "Oh, it's Mercedes, Siemens, and Bosch." We have to think about those. It's like, nope. And just like mm. in a, in the U.S., it's really small business is the secret to the American economic yeah. miracle. It's not these big Fortune 500 companies everyone thinks of. Yeah. It's like, nope. It's really all the other stuff. And so that's the key to every other country. Yeah. And I think that's what everyone should should think about is that. You have two options. You can either go work for a big company or you can create one yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's well said. With that, we're going to say goodbye, I think, in this episode. So start your own company. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> if you don't want do to it. work with yeah, you can do, do it. it. You know, and if you fail, you can always go work for the big company. But yeah, when you're 55 might, uh, or 60, it's a bit late to say, oh, that startup <laughs> I wanted to do 20 years ago, do yeah, it now while you can. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's some nice words from Scott at the end here. And that so, was actually um, my rationale. That's why I didn't, I said, I'll take the two-year runner on here. Maybe this company is going to fail. I can always go mm -hmm. work for a big company and it turned out to be successful. So do it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much, Scott. So to everybody, please follow Scott on his, his social media channels, especially on Twitter, because I think he adds a lot of value and really looks at the details and we need that to understand the bigger picture and um yeah i really enjoy your content as well everything the interviews you do i, I watch <laughs> always watch them because those uh, small nuggets that are in there are so important like for example the nitty gritty you, you went down with the with the um with the actuators in the hands and and everything and the um, where the motors are placed in the Tesla bot I've linked this video already so please watch that and um yeah there's only one last thing now to say and that's goodbye everybody cheers wasn't this episode awesome let's accelerate the pace of innovation by subscribing to Tesla Fix it is my absolute favorite channel on the whole interwebs